of you here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, grab your Bible, turn to James chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 16 through 18 this morning. This is our text for this morning as we continue our series through the book of James, talking about real faith. That's what James is after, is a faith that is genuine among his brothers and sisters. A faith that is real. And part of what real faith means is having a real and a clear and a compelling view of who God is. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, hear now the word of the true and living God. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let us pray. Father, bless the reading of your word. Bless us as we pause and ponder over this passage before us this morning. Give us insight. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we saw the reality of temptation, the the root of temptation, which is born by our own desires, and also the results of temptation when we give in to temptation and sin that leads to death. And now James exhorts his brothers and sisters further, do not be deceived, don't be led astray. This was a shepherding term. And James, uh, I'm persuaded this is the half-brother of Jesus, who had a post-resurrection encounter with the risen Lord. His life was changed. He became a leader in the Jerusalem church, probably a bishop, an elder, a shepherd of the Lord's church in Jerusalem. And his shepherd's heart is on display here as he doesn't want his brothers, his sisters, to wander, to stray from the truth. And what truth is that? Well, certainly about sin, and about the origin of sin, the origin of temptation. Don't believe the lie, in other words. The lie from the father of lies, the evil one, the devil. Serious business. Serious business when it comes to temptation. Also, do not be deceived about the origin, the source of temptation. It doesn't come from God. We saw that last week. God tempts no one. And so, don't get it twisted. And don't be deceived when it comes to God and temptation. God is far from the one who entices us to evil. And so verse 16 serves kind kind of as as a transitional verse. Do not be deceived, my brothers, especially, again, about the nature of God. To be confused and to be an error about the nature of God, that is a very serious and a very dangerous error. It's a very serious and dangerous error that many, even today, are deceived about who God is. They want to attribute sin and evil to God as though He is the author of sin and the author of evil. James is adamant here. Don't be deceived about that. Don't believe the lie. There is uh, nothing in God that is evil or that is sinful. Far from being the one who entices us to evil, as James says here, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. And so it is important for his original readers, it's important for us to have high and lofty and noble thoughts about God, to keep God in the proper perspective and ourselves not to be deceived about God. Far from being the author of evil, God is the author of everything good. It's kind of the the argument that's uh, packaged here that's uh, kind of unseen and unspoken, is that the author of everything good cannot be the author of evil. Every 
good gift. Uh, every good gift is from God. And, and part of the way that this is phrased, it's a good, good gift because God, the giver, is himself good. And so the, the giving is likewise good because, again, God is good. That's the first key thing we need to keep in mind about God is He is good. Everything in Scripture and also everything in the world testifies to the fact that God is good. Old Testament, New Testament unite in order to affirm the goodness of God. And then you look at the world around us. I know there's a lot of evil. We were reminded about just how evil things are. There are evil people in this world yesterday with uh, the assassination attempt on the former president. It's a bad thing. I think we can all agree about that. That's an evil thing. Shouldn't have happened. And yet, we rebellious creatures who, James says, our desires are distorted and twisted. God allows us to live on his earth he gives us food in our bellies, roofs over our heads, money in our bank account. He allows us to continue to live. Even though we have sinned and broken His law, that is a good Creator. He continually blesses us, gives us rain, sends His Son on the just and the unjust. God is a good God. Even in situations that are bad. God is providentially at work to accomplish his good purposes in those things every good gift and also every perfect gift and again the way this is written it could be that james has in mind here not only the good gift of say our salvation but also the perfect gift of our perfection god is at work to sanctify us and set us apart more and more he's right james is right to christians after all and so the good gift of our salvation is improved upon by the perfect gift of our sanctification as we are set apart and conform more and more to the image of Christ. It's a, a, a perfect gift. There is nothing lacking. Uh, it is a complete gift. That's the force here of what James is communicating here. It is interesting. There are two different words that James uses here for the word gift. They're translated with the same word in the English, but he does have two different words here, and they each have their own subtle nuance to them. But what James is seeking to communicate here is the goodness and the perfection of God, and as a result, he gives good and perfect gifts. They are from above, which here James is communicating that God is above. If these good and perfect gifts have their source in God, then they must come from where God dwells, which is in heaven. He, and, they, and so they come from above. James also here, since he is pointing us to heaven, is communicating that God is a spiritual being, which that's just what Jesus taught us. God is spirit, John chapter 4 and verse 24. They're, they're from above, and they're coming down from God. Um, they're not falling down, kind of haphazard, kind of like how just raindrops kind of fall indiscriminately. They are coming down. Uh, there is nothing left to chance here. That when it comes to the gifts coming down from God, there is purpose and intentionality in God giving these good gifts and these perfect gifts. Uh, and so nothing here is left to chance. Um, they are given... On purpose, they come down, they're handed down from the Father of lights. This is a very interesting way of talking about God, but again, I believe it communicates once more His perfection. Elsewhere in Scripture, we understand that God is light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul talks about how God dwells in unapproachable light in 1 Timothy. And so God here, the Father... He's the father of lights. And there's going to be a play here on the, the, the theme of lights here to communicate the unchanging nature of God. But first, James wants to communicate that God is our father. We, we know, again, elsewhere in Scripture, you are the light of the world, Jesus says to his followers. We don't have light in ourselves. We, kind of like the moon, reflect the light. The moon reflecting the light of the sun. Well, in a similar way, our Father, who dwells in unapproachable light, 
is the Father of us. James is going to talk about how we've been born or begotten of God here in the next verse, but we merely reflect the light of God into the world. We reflect the light of Christ. He is the light of the world, as he says in John chapter 8. And so James communicates here that we are the lights in this world. And so by our good deeds, we let our light shine before other people. They, in turn, glorify God who is in heaven. With whom, the end of verse 17, talking about God, who's the Father of lights. With him, there is no variation or shadow due to change. What James seems to have in mind here is about how, you know, the, the sun, at different times during the year, it's at different places in the sky. Uh, the, the moon has its course that it runs, and even it has its shadow of variation, right? You have the new moon where it's not shining, the full moon when it's at its brightest, and then crescent and half and all that. The stars, they have their various light that they shine, and they're tracking and they change positions just in the course of a night as they go overhead. And in the midst of all this change, James here talks about God as the Father of lights, and there's no change in Him, no shadow. God, again, is unchanging in His nature, uh, which it, James is just riffing off of the Old Testament in James, uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, where God Himself says, I, Yahweh, do not change. He's unchanging. Which... Um, I believe confronts one of the, you know, it's important that we have the right thoughts about God. We want to avoid any error in our thinking about who God is. And unfortunately, there is a, an idea about God that um, it's, uh, it's called open theism. And it's the idea that God doesn't have perfect knowledge of future events. Because the future hasn't happened yet, God doesn't have knowledge of that. And it is a, a philosophy that is looking for a text of Scripture to land upon, and they, they do have texts that they appeal to in order to attempt to demonstrate this. To this, James says, no, there, God, he, if, if God were to learn about future events as they happen, that would mean that his knowledge changes because it increases. But God is unchanging, which means his knowledge is perfect. Indeed, he's the God of knowledges uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. He has perfect knowledge of everything that's going to happen, everything that's going to fall out. It, no, nothing surprises God. He doesn't sit there and kind of look at events and go, man, I, I didn't see that coming. Now what am I going to do? He's unchanging. And that applies to his knowledge. He has perfect knowledge as well. No shadow of change. Unlike his creation and unlike us creatures, God is unchanging which is all the more reason why we, surrounded by a world of change, things change on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We need to look to God as the unchangeable one and hold to His unchanging hand as we sing from time to time. I would be remiss if I didn't accentuate also here that He is the Father. God is Father. This is one of those key themes in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, that unite to communicate the nature of God. And as a father, then, he is he's not uh, capricious, he's not arbitrary, he is one who uh, is loving, and in love, he saves sinners. In love, he then gives every good and perfect gift that we need in order to follow hard after Jesus. Uh, and so God, he is... Uh, seen here as the Father. All these things. God is good. He's perfect. He's from above. He is unchanging. He's the Father. Just all these things are packed into this one verse that James is at pains to communicate. He doesn't want his readers to be deceived. He doesn't want us to be deceived about the nature of God. That God is all of these things. Which then leads us to verse 18. Again, the spotlight's on God here. And what is in, in view here in verse 18 is the new birth, which is to talk about even our own salvation and regeneration. That God is the hero of this story. You didn't birth yourself. You, you don't have the, the resources and the ability to, to give yourself the new birth. 
This is part, it's a good and perfect gift that comes from God as well. It begins with the will of God, of His own will. And that is in the emphatic position in the original language. James front loads this with a word about the will of God. That it is according to God's will that He brought us forth. That He granted us this new birth. And He did this by means of the word of truth. Uh, and the true word here seems to be James's way of talking about the gospel. And he'll have a lot to say about the gospel as we get deeper into the book of James. But the gospel is a, a word of truth. It is the word of truth. That God, as, as it is spoken and preached to other people, God, by means of that, brings people forth and brings them to new life. And this is all according to uh, the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Of His own will. Again, that's, that's God's will. He brought us forth by the Word, by means of the Word of truth. As you think about God's will as it relates to the Gospel, it was the will of God, the Father, to send the Son into the world. It was also the will of God, the Son, to willingly enter into His own creation. And then, by that same will, Christ lives a perfect and sinless life for some 33 years. A perfect and sinless life that you and I could never live. He does that on our behalf. Keeps the law perfectly where we have failed. Even where the original Adam failed. And then, by the same will, goes to the cross, hangs there for six hours, before finally dying in our place for our sins and for our salvation. But then by the same will, is not only buried, three days later is raised from the dead, and has ascended back to the Father's right hand where He lives and rules forevermore, and He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is the gospel. And this is all according to the will of God. Think about it. It was the will of God, the prophet Isaiah says, to crush Him. But in that crushing, through the death of Christ, it means our salvation. And many are counted righteous. The righteousness of Christ credited to us as our sins are credited to Him on the cross. Behold, brothers and sisters, the will of God. What it took, the, it was His will. That through that word of truth, and that is the true word, to bring us forth as we, hear, as we hear it in due time. Think about it. The gospel came to you at some point in your life, my brother, my sister. You heard it. And the, the Spirit powerfully worked in that in order to cause conversion within us. And so we were obedient to the call of the gospel, obedient to the voice of our Lord, turned away from sin, confessed Him as Lord, we're baptized, raised to live this new life with the Holy Spirit living within us. All of our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. Of His own will, He brought us forth by that word of truth. So that, here's the purpose. It's not just ollie ollie income free, now do whatever you want. Because you've been washed in the blood of Jesus so that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. And that's, that's who we are as humans, by the way. We are creatures of the Creator. And so James is maintaining that, that distinction between the Creator and the creatures. And that's an important distinction to maintain. But then this first fruits business, and you know, we're some 2,000 years removed from when James first wrote this. James, as I mentioned before when we introduced this epistle, this is probably a primarily, predominantly Jewish church. It's very early in the church's history, probably within a, a decade and a half of when Jesus came and the whole Christ event and everything related to that. And so, to a Jewish ear, this would have had very important significance. I believe they would have immediately made the connection back to the law. And in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 
9 through 14, Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, you have instruction there about what's called the Feast of the First Fruits. And what would happen is at harvest time, the Jewish people would bring in their harvest, and of all that they brought in, they would take the very best and the very finest, and that first fruits, best and first, they would offer that to God. They'd bring it to the temple, and it would be offered to God. The first fruits. And so, again, the significance of this, we are a kind of first fruits that a saved Christian who's been begotten by the word of truth, by the will of God, we have become this first fruit to God. We've been, just as that best and first of the harvest was set aside for the purpose of offering worship to God, so we, of all the creatures, we have become this first fruit set apart and offered to God, our whole life offered to God as an offering. And I can hear Paul echoing here, right? Uh, from, from Romans uh, 12, and how we are living sacrifices to God. Well, that's here uh, just a play on that for, for James. The harvest began at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And it continues as the gospel goes forth into the world. And it's been happening now for some near 2,000 years. We ourselves are a kind of first fruit, set apart for the purpose of glorifying God with our bodies and with our lives. We join with these original 12 tribes in the dispersion in order to magnify and glorify God. Again, and there's going to be more on this when we pick this up next week. Because James is, is really going to emphasize how we have an obligation, uh, a responsibility to God in light of what He has done by His will in order to not merely be a hearer of the Word, we need to put it into practice and do what it says. And that also is part of what it means to be that first fruit. That because of the incredible work of God in our life, of granting us new spiritual life, now we merely offer that life back to Him by seeking to obey Him in all that we do. God has been and will continue to redeem lost creatures through the Word of Truth. And just as it is a remarkable thing when a child is brought forth into this world, it is all the more spectacular, the supernatural work of God in order to bring forth a new Christian, a new babe in Christ into this world. And so, again, what started here this morning with that word of warning concludes with the marvelous, good, and perfect work of God. A work that unites each one of us, brothers and sisters. He's done it in your life. He's done it in mine. And as we continue to share the gospel with others, He will continue to do it in the lives of others. So we read. So we believe. Let's commit this to prayer. Help us, Father, to abandon all low views of who You are. And help us to cultivate, develop, cherish, and love the view of You that You have revealed in Scripture. To love and to cherish even You as You have revealed Yourself in the Word of Truth. We thank You for Christ. We thank You for Your ongoing work in this world. Help us to glorify You with our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.